Shiplin is writing a biography of one of our local notables, Henry S. Randall. And if you're a member and you've gotten our newsletter, you're two into a series of, I believe, four articles. So the next one will be coming out in our November issue on Henry S. Randall. He is a native of Portland. He was born here and raised in Syracuse. He returned to Portland for college and then spent three years in the graduate program in American history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison to prepare for an academic career. But then spent 30 years in the aerospace industry in Washington, D.C. before taking an early retirement to return full time to the historical projects he started many years before. Today's presentation is part of his ongoing research for his work in progress, The Life of Henry S. Randall. Thank you. Now, why is this topic of interest to us today at all? A couple, a couple things come to my mind, and I'd like to hear from you guys coming back. I'm interested because I'm working on Henry Randall, who wrote a biography of Jefferson in, in the 1850s. So his relationship to any topic related to Jefferson, particularly this one, which I'll show you, is of particular interest, not just because it's scandalous, but because it really helps us understand how we create history, how we revise history, how sometimes we get it really wrong. You know, there's, is there anybody here today who has not heard about the DNA evidence? Pretty much everybody has, has heard of it in some capacity. Well, it's important for us as historians to continue to try to get the story right. We couldn't have had it more wrong for 150 some years, 160 years. Uh, similarly, you know, Abraham Lincoln and Ann Rutledge, for, for years and years, decades, I guess we would say, no way that there was a relationship between Lincoln and Ann Rutledge. And today, historians would say, no, it's probably pretty likely there was a relationship between Lincoln and Ann Rutledge. Whereas, you know, 40, 50 years ago, we saw that as no way it was going to happen. So sometimes we don't just get it a little bit wrong and refine the interpretation a little bit. Sometimes we get it real wrong. And the interpretations that I'll show you over the next hour or so reflect that. It's not reconciling two um, interpretations that are a little bit different. It's reconciling interpretations that are diametrically opposed. And, and, not, and not diametrically opposed in just some slight way, but in a very major way, which then cascades to how we interpret the past and how we interpret um, Jefferson particularly, but also Henry Randall. Now, the topic has been popular for a good many years. You know, we've seen movies such as the Sally Hemings movie, which came out based on a novel in 1979. We see today, thank you, we see today a major new novel by a guy named Stephen Connor. It's a novel. So I haven't read it all, I did start it, but for those of us that do look at it, let's keep in mind he does use some factual information, which he declares, but it is a novel. Okay. There's no way we know this much about Sally Hemings, as I'll share with you. But, but as a topic, you know, if you were to say, you know, what's important about this, it's one about historians trying to get the story right, or as you'll see, how we got it very wrong and we're very adamant about that and how we understand the particulars about Thomas Jefferson and his life. And I think it's a really good message about how we create history and how we shouldn't create history. Both of those are, are very important topics to us. So let's go to the first page there, and I'll introduce you to the main characters. First page doesn't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> the wonders of technology. <laughs> Well, right, right. well, what you're going to see when it comes up yeah. are, are three people. And what you see right now is what we know Sally Hemings looked like. Okay? In, in the brochure that w I passed out that was distributed by the Historical Society, we had an image of Sally Hemings. That is not an image of Sally Hemings. It, it, was, it was on there for, I'll say amusement, but it was on there to give representation and a little substance. We do not know what she looked like. As I'll show you, we have a couple of physical descriptions, but there is no known sketch, there's no portrait, certainly there was no daguerreotype and photographs for her. She dies in 1835. We do not know what she looked like. We do know some characteristics. 
and we do know some interpretive judgments about what she appeared to be, but we do not know what she looked like under any condition. So if you do see a picture of her, it's, it's not her. Okay. What we do have of her, however, is thousands, I'll say hundreds, maybe thousands, of people that are descended from her in some capacity or another. No, it's okay. So if we were smart enough to be able to put together a collage of what all the female descendants of Sally Hemings might look like, you might see some characteristic features that were hers, but there's no way we could attribute those back to her. So, so that's very important that we understand we do not know what she looked like. So that's going to be the first character in our, in our drama is Sally Hemings. She's born in 1773, dies 1835, and spends pretty much her entire life except for her first year at Monticello. And she is owned by Jefferson through that entire period. Okay. Second person in our drama is going to be Jefferson himself. Thomas Jefferson, born 1743, dies 1826, third president of the United States, large landowner in Virginia, was born into wealth. I don't want to say squandered his wealth, but doesn't die a wealthy man by any means. Dies in, in significant debt. And then the third person in our drama is from Cortland. Over here on Tompkins Street, you can see his house today. It's an insurance company today. And that little house was built by his father for him in 1834. So when he came back from marrying his wife from Auburn, Jane Paul Hemus, they took up residence there. And that's where, up on the second floor, in that building, Jefferson was written by Henry S. Randall. So those are the three main characters that we're going to talk about. There are going to be a lot of other people involved, but the drama, for me particularly, working, there they are. So on the far left, Sally, totally notional. So we got here the mistress, the master, and the biographer. <laughs> and we do not know what she looked like, but I'll tell you what we think are some of her characteristics in just a moment. Jefferson, that portrait's from 1805 by Rembrandt Peel, and this is an actual photograph of Henry, probably about the time, 1850 or so, when, when he was working on the biography. So we got the mistress, the master, and the biography. And my interest, of course, I started out as a Jefferson um, enthusiast, and the topic for my Randall, for me, I'm very interested in knowing how he came to the interpretation that he came to and the role that he played in creating, I'll call a family defense, uh, in terms of the relationship that did or did not exist between Jefferson and Sally Hemings. So with that, let's uh, move on, John. See if the second one comes up. There we go. Okay, so for our agenda today, I'll follow a chronological approach. We're gonna follow the story of Jefferson and Hemings from its inception through to today, the origin of the charges, the initial defense, how Randall was roped into it, how he became part of that discussion, the refinement of the defense in the 1860s, 1870s, and then we go through about a hundred year period where it's a non-event. We don't hear about it, you don't discuss it, it's not a major event in the historical biographies, certainly not the journals, and then with the advent of the civil rights movement in the, in the 1960s, there is renewed interest in the Jefferson and the Hemings, and we get some challenges to a traditional viewpoint. And the traditional viewpoint is going to be that relationship never existed, couldn't have existed. Okay. And then we get some challenges in that in the 1960s, and the historical establishment to their, um, I'll say, it, it wasn't, it's not our finest moment. We come to a defense of the old version, as you'll see from the family, and deny that that relationship could have existed. And then we finally get some conclusive proof in the late 1990s about what that relationship was. And then I'll close with some thoughts and be interested in hearing from you guys about what that means for our view of Henry Randall as a biographer. You know, what role did he play? Was he duped? Was he co-opted? How did he become part of that and the, and the role that he played in this little drama? So, so here's what we're going to do. We'll look at the controversy, how it came about, how the initial defense came out, which originates as a family defense for a private matter. Family defense for a private, it becomes a public defense 
at a point in time, which I'll show you, have a big long gap where it's not an issue, and then we have a very explosive um, turn of events based on so, some individuals. People do make a difference in history. Historians make a difference in history. As we'll see, the older historians make a, make a bad history, and we have some newer historians which have created a much better history because it's more truthful. Okay. And then we'll close with some thoughts about what, what's this mean for a biography of Henry Randall. Okay. John? So, now, we'll go, we'll go dormant for a minute here. Okay. So the origin of the controversy is very easy to pinpoint. Okay. Let me read you something that appeared in the September 1802 Richmond Recorder. This is after there was the election of 1800, but this is two years after the presidential election of 1800. And it's signed James Thompson Calendar. Can everybody hear me in the back? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, can you hear back there? Uh, and it starts, it is well known that the man whom it delighteth the people to honor keeps and for many past years has kept as his concubine one of his own slaves. Her name is Sally. That's in the newspaper in 1802. And we can pinpoint that pretty well as the origin of the public controversy. Now, prior to the public controversy, privately, it had been rumored for a long time that there was something funny going up on the mountain, going on up in the mountain, and that there were light colored slaves, and some of them looked like Mr. Jefferson. And it was a non event. Now, let me preface that by observing that miscegenation or the inter, um, the, the biological interworkings between the black slaves and the white owners, that was not unheard of. It was actually quite common. It was illegal, but it was quite common in Virginia and the other southern states. So if Jefferson had a relationship, it was not necessarily remarkable. It was something that was heard about was rumored, was gossiped about, and certainly the slaves looked a lot like him. A lot of them did. Now some of that derives from, as I'll tell you in a second, many of the slaves at Monticello were light-skinned. They came from his wife's inheritance from her father, John Wales. John Wales was a very wealthy landowner, lawyer, had many slaves, and when he dies, a good portion of the 135, matter of fact, slaves come to Jefferson by his wife. And a lot of those were because the master himself was the father of a good number of those. So rumors up on the mountain, not an event, not legal, not universal, but, but it was not unheard of. Okay? But now it becomes a public event. <coughs> James Thompson Calendar has published that in such a way that people are going to take notice of that. Now, who was Calendar? Calendar comes from England in 1793. He flees England because he's a scandal monger. He takes up a position that says Scotland ought to secede, separate independence from, from UK, from England. And that's seditious, that's traitorous. And there's a warrant out for his arrest, and he flees to the New World. Lands here in Philadelphia, 1793, he takes up with the Republican press. That seems to fit his egalitarian notions of government. And the Republicans kind of like his scandal mongering. It works well for them against the Federalists. Now, Je Jefferson is a Republican. The Federalists are opposing Jefferson in, in the 1790s. Our political parties are just beginning to form. Well, he takes up journalism, he writes book length um, attacks on the Federalists, he writes pamphlets, he does some journalism. One of his most notorious um, accomplishments is taking down Alexander Hamilton. Now Alexander Hamilton was attracted to the ladies, <laughs> as, as we can see in the, in the play that's going on right now. And Hamilton had been entrapped by a team of Maria Reynolds and her husband James in what we call the Badger Game. And the Badger Connor game was the wife seduces somebody, makes him think it's his idea, 
carries on a relationship for a couple of times, arranges to be discovered by the husband. Oh my lord, what's going on? And then they blackmail him. Uh -huh. Well, Hamilton fell for the game. Okay? And so he's blackmailed. He's paying the blackmail. Well, our fellow calendar finds out that Hamilton is making payments and he accuses Hamilton of corruption. Here's the Secretary of the Treasury <laughs> making payments off the books to somebody and they see records of that. Very bad, very bad for your political career. Mm -hmm. Hamilton did not always have the best political judgment. And what he chose to do was, well, if I just tell the truth, everybody will forgive me. <laughs> so Hamilton writes this lengthy response and he publishes it, and he says, yes, I was an adulterer. Yes, I did carry on with Maria Reynolds. Unfortunate, but I did do it. But I'm not corrupt. I was paying the blackmail, yes, but I wasn't using government funds to do it. <laughs> so his view is, hey, yeah, I'm an adulterer, but I'm not corrupt. It didn't play real well in Philadelphia or the rest of the nation, and that pretty much ends Alexander Hamilton's political career. That gives you a taste of the type of journalism the calendar was doing. So, so he takes up the political journalism for the um, for the Republican press, and he gets put in prison. He gets put in prison in the Adams administration because he writes attacks on John Adams. And we had passed the Alien Sedition Act, and under the Sedition Act, you can't criticize the president, and he does. And they put him in prison for nine months, and they fine him a couple hundred dollars. He serves his time. He gets out the last day of the Adams administration. Jefferson gives him a pardon, and they remit the money. Well, that's not enough for Calendar. So Calendar says, boy, I'd like more. And they realize that Calendar is a bit of a danger. Irresponsible, um, reckless, usually fairly accurate. He doesn't spin it a tale from whole cloth, but he certainly um, shapes it. And Jefferson doesn't want to live with that. And his, and his people argue that, that you shouldn't. So the story kind of spreads around New England. They put it, they make songs about it, they write pamphlets about it, and they, write, or they, they put cartoons, there's poetry. Um, so the, the Hemings um, accusations are, are going to be significant. But back to Calendar, how he came to write this piece, he wants the Jefferson administration to give him the postmastership of Richmond. Richmond, Virginia was a plum post, 50, paid $1,500 a year. And he was terribly in debt. And the Jefferson people say, that's not a good idea. And Jefferson agrees with that. And, he, and they write to him and say, you're not going to have that post. He thought it was his due because he took, the, he, took the, he took one for the team and did time for the Adams administration. Had a fine, but the but the Jefferson people say no, not going to happen. You're not going to get. It. So he, Calendar responds back, well, if you don't give it to me, I've got personal information that is going to embarrass Jefferson, and if he doesn't give it to me, I'm going to publish it. Jefferson sends back word, now we're not going to give it to you. If that's what you got to do, go ahead and do it. So that's when he writes that first article, and there's about four or five others that follow in September, October, November refining the story a little bit more, making some corrections to things he got wrong in 1802. Does not affect the election, the midterm congressional elections in 1802. Does not affect the presidential election in 1804. And he himself, Calendar, drowns in 1803. Went off to take a bath in the James River, drunk, and, and he drowns. Suspected it's probably a suicide, but he drowns in 1803. And that's kind of the end of it. Jefferson is silent. He does not address the topic. He doesn't say, I, like Hamilton, he doesn't say I did it, he doesn't say I didn't do it, he doesn't say it existed. He is silent on the matter. Okay, so that's the origin of the controversy. How it becomes public, what was private. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, about what was known and who did know it. So the controversy doesn't really take hold. It's, it's a non-event. It's under, kind of like it was in the 1790s before calendar. Not, not a significant event. Okay, John, next one. Mm -hmm. I think you need to go backwards. 
Okay. Backwards. I guess the slide's not in there. Yeah. Okay. So Sally Hemmings. Now the other person in this in this tale for us, Sally. Uh, let me give you some background on her. She's a quadroon. A quadroon means you're three quarters white. Now her mother was a mulatto, uh, born of a sea captain from England and a black mother. Sally's father was John Wales, a rich lawyer from the eastern part of Virginia down the Williamsburg area. He lived in a place called Eppington. And John Wales, lawyer, plantation owner, a lot of slaves. Okay, so Sally is a quadroon. She has a number of sisters. And her mother has, I don't know, six or eight children by John Wales. He'd gone through two or three wives and then he took a, a black mistress. He had a lot of kids. And one of those kids by his last wife was Martha Wales, who would become Martha Wales Skeleton, and then she became widow, Martha Wales Jefferson. Jefferson's wife and Sally Hemings had the same father. Yeah. Uh, that again? <laughs> <laughs> Just the way Jefferson's wife, Martha Wales, and Sally Hemings, we believe, had the same father, John Wales, a white man living in Eppington. Sally Hemings is the last of his children. He dies shortly thereafter in 1773, uh, after she was born. So she's a quadruple. And her mother is a mulatto. And it's important because Sally is going to have some pretty direct examples of how a black woman that looks like a white woman that maybe is a white woman to you and me navigates the system. Her mother found some latitude, let's say control, that's a bad way to say it, but she found a way to make slavery less onerous perhaps to her by having a relationship with the slave master. Her children would be treated a little bit better, she would have a little bit easier time of it. Um, her sister named Mary married a white man named Bell, and they lived freely together in Charlottesville, and they actually bought a couple of her children off of Jefferson, um, and, and they lived there. And then Sally herself is going to navigate the system a little bit too. She's going to take, I don't want to say take advantage, but she's going to make the best of circumstances that, that she's given. Okay, so, so Sally, she's born in 1773, she's a quadroon, and we have no pictures of her. Again, I reiterate, we do not know what she looks like. That was just notional. And she comes with an inheritance to Jefferson. The father dies, John Wales dies, and he leaves a lot of money, and he leaves a lot of slaves. And Jefferson, the portion that goes to Jefferson's wife, includes 135 slaves. But Jefferson and Sally Hemings were half-sisters. Yes. All right? They had, they had the, the same, same father. Father, different mothers. Yes. Yes. Did they know one another? No. But I don't. I don't. Well, in time they certainly did. Yes. Um, Sally Hemings born in 1773, so she's going to be 20 years younger than than Martha, than Jefferson's wife. But yes, they were aware of each other and they did know each other. Yes. Which it's a good question, and then it'll become more apparent even later about what do we know in our community about who we are. You know, a historian once said, our, our paternity for all of us is nothing but hearsay. <laughs> so Sally, she comes to Monticello as part of the inheritance, and this is where Jefferson gets a whole lot of land, 135 slaves, and a whole bunch of debt. John Wales owed a lot of money, and Jefferson takes about 4,000 pounds of that um, to pay off. Now, in that 135 slaves, that was divided up four ways. So th this was just a fourth of what John Wales had to give. And in that group of 135 <coughs> slaves is Sally, Betty Hemings, her mother, her sisters, 
and a whole bunch of other hammocks, a whole little community that comes to Monticello. Now these are different. They look white. And they're taken into the Monticello family, which more than doubles Jefferson's holdings and slaves. And they're given special assignments at Monticello. Easier assignments, house assignments, they're given money, paid, paid for this, not allowed to keep their money, um, and they're ordered not to be whipped, not to be pushed around, so to speak. M much different, and it did cause some dissension amongst the slave community, that much. but you can see from the very outset they are treated differently. Okay. Now Sally accompanies Mary Jefferson to Paris. Jefferson had been sent to Paris as our envoy to replace Benjamin Franklin, and he took his oldest daughter, Martha, with him, leaving two daughters here in Virginia. One daughter dies, sickness. Before the other daughter can die, he says, send her over here. So he instructed the aunt to send Mary to Paris, but to have her accompanied by a mature person. Well, they send a playmate of Mary's, Sally Hemmings, instead of sending a mature person. And Abigail Adams, who meets them in England on the way over, said that the, this, um, this immature young woman who needed as much care as Mary, um, I don't know why they, they sent her. But anyway, she goes, and she's 14 at the time, and they go over to Paris. She, um, Sally, will learn to speak some French. We don't know if she learned to read or write French. Uh, maybe she did, there's no, we don't have any mark of her writing. We don't have any notion about whether or not she could read. Suspect she could, because her children could. Um, some, some of her children could, and we know her brother could, could write. So, but again, in Virginia, it was illegal to teach slaves to read or write. You couldn't do that, um, illegal. So she goes over to France, and then she comes back. We think, and I'll read it to you in just a moment here. The word is that he made promises to Sally to get her to come back, that she wanted to stay in France. She was free. Um, they looked upon blacks. They looked upon uh, slavery in a much different way than we did, and that if she had stayed in France, she could have remained free. But again, she would be a young, immature, unsophisticated, woman in France and the revolution is starting. So that's not particularly the safest place to be on your own without skill, um, so to speak. So she does come back to Virginia with Jefferson and between 1795 and 1808 she has six children. She has Harriet in 1795 and, and the child dies. Beverly, born a year later, a year after the death of Harriet, he's born in 1798. He's very white. They let him run away. In 1822, he disappears. Now, there was the practice in Virginia and other states where you would allow a slave who had become white enough to pass, so they, that's a phrase they used to pass, to wander away from the plantation. You don't seek to retrieve them, you don't send a slave catcher um, for them, you allow them to pass into white society they would um, formulate some story of their origin, they would not acknowledge you know, black ancestry, and they would intermarry with white people, and they would carry their life on from there. So Beverly, he leaves in 1822 or so, not too long before Jefferson um, dies in 1826. Another daughter dies in 1799, 1800. A second Harriet is born, and in 1822 she's allowed to run away. Too. Same year that Beverly does. And Jefferson's overseer will write in a memoir, which we'll talk about a little bit later, that I personally put her on the stage to Philadelphia and gave her $50. Now, the sale of, the rumor goes that Jefferson's daughter is being sold. You see that in the press. And that was the subject of the first black novel written in America by, by William Wells Brown called Clotel, C L O T E L. That was in 1853. The subject of that was Jefferson's daughter 
being sold at a slave auction in New Orleans. And that's the subject. And she, we do know that he did have a daughter put on the stage to Philadelphia, and then she disappears. We don't know what became of her. We think she came back to Washington, D.C., and made a, we'll say, white life of herself, passed into white society and had children. Okay. So, and then there's two sons, Madison and Eston. Um, Madison named after James Madison and Thomas Eston um, named after, um, I think, a cousin of Jefferson's. But they're both freed by Jefferson's will. And as I'll read to you in just a, in a little bit, the charge was that Jefferson had agreed to make any children that Sally had free if indeed she agreed to come back to Virginia with him. We have a couple points that <coughs> indicate that that agreement probably is true, that he did make such an agreement. <coughs> what else do we know about her? Jefferson dies in 1826. She's not in his will being freed. Now, that does not mean that there wasn't a special provision that nobody has seen outside of the Jefferson family that said she's freed. Now, I, I, my own personal belief is that probably they said, yes, um, she is to be freed if she, if, she had to, if she had to produce documentation. But Martha Jefferson Randolph, the, this lady right here, Jefferson's daughter, gives her her time. That was a phrase that we used, give her time. And when she, she was assessed, Sally, when they did the assessment for the slaves at Monticello before the big auction in 1827, she was assessed at $50. She's old. She, she's a seamstress, but she's certainly not going to have any more children at that age, and she's not going to be much of a field hand. So there's a price of $50. Uh, what that means, I don't know exactly. Okay. But she's given her time, and she moves into Charlottesville with her two sons, Madison and Eston. Now, Madison and Eston were not yet 21 when Jefferson died. They were given their freedom at 21. Until then, their, their uncle took care, looked out, he had, he had um, responsibility for them, so to speak. And Sally dies in 1835. We don't know where she's buried. We suspect she's buried underneath the parking lot at the Hampton Inn in Charlottesville today. <laughs> but there's no marker there. There's no, there, there's no indication that we really know for sure. Okay. She appears in a census in 1830 and 1833. And that census in 1830 says there's a white female between the ages of 50 and 60 living here. And we suspect that that is probably Sally Hemming. That, that was registered in that in that census. So we don't know a whole lot about her. Um, so it, it makes it very difficult to uh, generalize about the nature of a relationship with them between Jefferson and Sally County. What does she look like? We we only have two descriptions. I'll, I'll say three descriptions. One is by a slave, Isaiah Jefferson, in 1847. He told somebody, Sally, mighty near white, very handsome, long straight hair down her back. Okay. Then in 1851, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, a grandson of Jefferson's, tells our, our the main character here of everything, Henry Randall, right? Tells him when he's down in in, um, in Virginia doing research for his biography, he tells Randall, Dusky Sally. That was the phrase that. Um, that's the grandson. She was referred to by a lot of names in the press. Dusky Sally was pretty looking and bright witted girl. Light colored and decidedly good looking. Those are two descriptions that Thomas Jefferson Randolph gives to Henry Randolph. Those are the only descriptions we have about what she looked like. Again, if we were to take a composite of all the descendants we suspect came from Sally Hemings and Jefferson, and we're, we're able to say which characteristics are in and which ones are out, we can come to some view of what she might look like. But, but we have no idea what, what she looked like, other than these, we know she's, she could pass for white, and we know she was very pretty, and quick-witted, I don't know what that means exactly in terms of book learning, probably not too much, but in terms of being clever, probably. 
So that's what we know about Sally. And that's what we know about calendar. And now we're up to the slide we have, no, we're up to the slide we have uh, on the view graph. The, the origin of the defense. Now Jefferson during his lifetime said nothing. He did not deny the charges of Sally Hemings. He did not acknowledge the relationship of Sally Hemings. He said nothing. And the family would make a statement, well, you can't prove a negative. And if I get drawn into an argument about I can't prove I did, I can't prove I didn't, mm -hmm. and all I do is, you know, give more fuel to, to the charges. But Jefferson never said yes, never said no. He, he ignored. And I don't think it was all that important to him. However, his daughter, Martha, it was very important to her. Now, she had fulfilled a very close role with Jefferson after his wife died. His wife died in 1782, after 10 years of marriage. He makes a deathbed promise to her, I will not remarry. And his wife asked for that. She had been brought up by a stepmother. That was very cruel. And she said to Jefferson on her deathbed, we have that from a couple sources, asked Jefferson to make the promise. Didn't say don't have a relationship with little women, but she said, I don't want I don't want our girls to be brought up by a stepmother. And Martha fulfills a relate a role at the White House at Monticello as hostess, and she becomes a very close confidant to Jefferson. She claims I was his constant companion after the mother had died in 1782 when Jefferson was in such grief. And she, more than anybody else, took the accusation quite to heart. Her, 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 her son, and we can um, turn that, John. Her son, these are two of her sons. She had a whole bunch of kids. And two of her sons, the one on the right here is Thomas Jefferson Randolph. That's the oldest grandson. And the one on the left, George with Randolph, is the youngest grandson. The one on the left, a little bit smarter than the guy on the right, he was a lawyer, an intellectual, was Secretary of War of the Confederacy for a short period of time. Okay. On the right, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, kind of managed Jefferson's estates, was a farmer, <coughs> somewhat of a hack politician, a pro-unionist guy to a degree, Jacksonian Democrat. And these are going to be two of the principal contacts that Henry Randolph's going to have. Okay. So she's on her deathbed, Martha. Now this is 1836. She is the Niece, right? Sally Henry. Sally Henry just ran. Her mother's half sister. Okay, so Sally would have been her aunt. Now, the, there are rumors that Martha never particularly appreciated Sally. That would have represented a close relationship with Jefferson. It would have been resentful, perhaps, to her. And the gossip is that she was a little um, not nice necessarily to, to the Hemings people, particularly Sally. But so she's going to die in 1836. Shortly before she dies, she calls these two characters into the death into, into her death chamber, and it's not on the verge of death, but it's in her final final months or her days, and she says to them, "Okay, John," she said, "I want you to remember to take care of grandfather's memory and reputation." Okay, mom, we'll, we'll be glad to do that. And then she further tells them, do you remember that last slave that looked so much like Grandpa? That probably would have been Thomas Aston. And they said, yeah, we remember that. And she says, well, go get the farm book. Now, the farm book was a book that Jefferson kept at the Massachusetts Historic Society today. And it's about, it's probably about this size, okay? 170-some pages, Jefferson kept um, information about his farms in there. Slaves that were born, slaves that died, acreage under, under tillage, um, crop yield, slaves that gave the blankets to, their feet. It, it was a farm management book. He's not going to put in there revealing things about his life or what he's thinking. That's not the purpose of the farm book. And Sally is mentioned in there about 35 times in one capacity or another. Just, and it's just in passing. And as you can see here, here's one page out of it where you, where you can see her birth is indicated 1773. But she says to the two sons, Keep in mind, if you have to prove that Jefferson is not the father of Sally, <clears throat> use this book, and it will show that Jeff. This is called. We'll call this a physical defense. Jefferson could not be the father because he wasn't here. 
If you look at the farm book, when each of these slave children to Sally Hemings was born, and you cross-reference that with Jefferson's fee books, his memorandum books, that uh, had money transactions, they would help locate where he was physically. You can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that your grandfather could not be the father because he wasn't physically there. Couldn't have happened. The biology just doesn't work. So, so this is the origin of the physical event. Now, up until now, now not really an event to the um, to the people. However, to her, to care for his memory, and this is for private consumption. She didn't say go go publish this to the world and and go cry it from from the newspaper and the pulpits and and um, and see you know, redress in the papers about all these lies. She said, keep in mind, this can irrefutably, irrefutably prove that Jefferson could not have been the father. Well, maybe so, maybe not. Okay? Now, in the 1830s, starting, um, and, and then growing, you, you have abolitionist agitation throughout the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, until we come to a crisis and we finally get the Civil War. Well, the abolitionists loved to bring this up. They would say, look at, look at those awful people in the South. As a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson, they, and they would use his as a him as a, as a gamut. Now, that hurt Jefferson's reputation. And by the time we get to 1850, Jefferson's reputation is a bit tarnished. He's tarnished because of the slavery issue. He's tarnished uh, maybe because of Sally Hammond. He's tarnished because of his religion, highly religious age, and Jefferson, let's say he was liberal in, in his religion, and he had taken a stance on states' rights during the uh, crisis of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. So the people in the North would look upon him as a secessionist, and his reputation, he's not thought of um, as the God, let's say, that we would see him in the 18, 1930s or 40s or 50s. His reputation's been selling. In 1850, Henry Randall, our man here in town, over there on Tompkins Street, determines in August of 1850, he's gonna write a biography of Jefferson. And he's fortunate to get an entree to the family, and the family agrees, come on down and we'll help you. We'll give you information, we'll tell you what we know, we think we got some documents, why don't you come down here and talk to us. Okay, John. So he does. And a very famous thing for us happens in 1851. In February of 1851, he's in Virginia, and he's seeking information about it. Now, who here has been to Monticello before? You yeah. have. Okay. So you probably recognize this. This is the East Terrace. Okay. Remember that we have the Honeymoon Cottage on one side and Thomas Mann Randolph studies on the other and we have these nice terraces which connect to the house and underneath here you have quarters and they were functional houses Some, sometimes they were used as, as slave cabins perhaps smokehouse um, storage um, facilities so in 1851 randall is visiting moldering you know monticello it's it's in not good situation in 1850 it's fallen down it hasn't been uh, maintain and Randolph takes them up here and they're standing over in this area someplace and let me read you what he offers to uh, to, to Henry. Our man is standing there and this is what Thomas Jefferson Randolph, one of those two kids that Martha said come on in here and I'll tell you about what you need to do. So the two men are standing in that area Walking about Moldering Monticello one day with Colonel Randolph, he showed me a smoke-blackened and sooty room in one of the colonnades and informed me it was Sally Hemings' room. He asked me if I knew how the story of Mr. Jefferson's connection with her originated. I told him I did not. There was a better excuse for it, said he, than you might think. She had children which resembled Mr. Jefferson so closely that it was plain they had blood in their veins. He said in one case the resemblance was so close that at some distance or in the dust the slave, dressed in the same way, might have been mistaken for Mr. Jefferson. So he's admitting, we got something to look like Jefferson. Um, and then he says, 
a very explosive thing that really shocks Henry Randall. He says, Colonel Randolph informed me that Sally Hemings was the mistress of Peter Carr and her sister Betsy, the mistress of Samuel Carr. And from these connections sprung the progeny which resembled Mr. Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson Randolph, the grandson of Thomas Jefferson, is speaking directly to Randolph and saying, hey, he didn't do it. It was Peter Carr. He's going beyond the physical defense that the mother had offered, his mother had offered, that said, hey, he couldn't have done it because he wasn't there. He's saying, oh, no, it was Peter and Samuel Carr. Now, Peter Carr and Samuel Carr were Jefferson's nephews. They lived at Monticello when they were young. Jefferson had married Dabney Carr, and that was his best friend. Dabney Jefferson, Jefferson's sister, another Martha, had married Dabney Carr, his best friend. And Dabney Carr dies young. First person buried in the Montreal Cemetery. Dabney Carr dies young, and Jefferson takes in his sister, who was his favorite sister, and the two kids, and raises them as they, as they were his own. Okay. So, so Thomas Jefferson Randolph says, it was Peter Carr and Samuel Carr. They did it. They did that. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Jefferson's oldest daughter, Mrs. Governor Randolph, that's Martha. Governor Randolph was Thomas Mann Randolph, her husband, took the dusky Sally stories much to heart. But she never spoke to her sons but once on the, this is Randall talking, but she never spoke to her sons but once on the subject, not long before her death, when she called them and then she offered the physical defense. That's further in the, in the letter. So that's explosive. Now, Randall's told, without a shadow of a doubt, hey, it was Peter Carr. Now, Randall, when he went down there, he knew about the rumors in, in the vicinity of Charlottesville, the Jefferson. He was familiar with Calendar's account. He was familiar with rumors that Jefferson had a relationship with the, uh, with the slaves. And he didn't really know what the truth was. Now, keep in mind, he's coming from Cortland. He's not a native of Charlottesville. So it's probably... You could take advantage of them somewhat. Next, John. So that's a major piece of history that we just saw take place. Now, the account goes on for about three or four pages. Very detailed, very specific, and there is not a shadow of doubt that it's not Peter and Samuel Carr. He said it is Peter Carr. He didn't say, I think it might be. No. He says it's Peter Carr. Okay. Now, what's Randall to think? Now these two characters, on the far left you got Raleigh Douglinson, on the far right you got Nathaniel Francis Cabell. Now Raleigh Douglinson was known to Jefferson. He was in, in, in a couple different ways. One, he was Jefferson's personal physician and he attended him when he died. He comes from England, from Keswick, England. He's known as the father of physiology here in the United States. He comes over and becomes a professor of anatomy at the University of Virginia. Eventually, he will go to um, the Jefferson Medical College um, as a professor in Philadelphia. Highly respected. He had an extended exchange with, with uh, Randall in letters, and he had close personal association. He was one of the first professors hired for the UVA by Jefferson. And so he's a very respected man, and he had close knowledge of the goings on. And he tells Randall, never heard the subject named in Virginia. That's a little suspect. But he tells Randall, never heard it talked about in Virginia, about Jefferson being the father of Sally Hemings' kids. Now, the person on the right, Nathaniel Francis Cabell, Randall carries on a correspondence with him because of his biography. An intellectual lawyer, he had edited the correspondence between Thomas Jefferson and his uncle, Cabell's uncle, Joseph Cabell, was one of the founders of the University of Virginia with Jefferson. And he tells an interesting story to Randall. He says, in youth, I heard the popular tales about Jefferson and Hemings. They came to my ears. And he goes on to tell them, but then as I got older, I looked into them, and I found that more than 20 years ago, that would have made it about 1838. Now, this is, he's telling this to Randall, who had just heard from Thomas Jefferson Randolph, it's those cars, 
He says, more than 20 years ago, I was told by Francis Dyer, told me that Peter Carr used to say that his was the sport and deviltry, while the uncle had the credit and the blame. <laughs> so Randall is getting some fairly trusted corroboration from intellectuals, from people of respect, that, yeah, it was the Carrs. So he's down there as a guest of the Jeffersons, the Randolphs. He's told by Thomas Jefferson Randolph, yeah, it was those cars. And he's told by Dunglinson and Cabell, never heard of it, and that um, we, we, we heard it was the cars too. So, so what's he going to do about that? That puts him in a ticklish situation. Okay, so, John, he talks to some friends. He talks to Samuel Joseph May, Theodore Parker, and Jared Sparks, among others. And now, they're all abolitionists to a degree. Samuel Joseph May is a Unitarian minister out of Syracuse at this time. Um, Theodore Parker is a Unitarian minister out of Boston, staunch abolitionist. And Jared Spark, president of Harvard, Unitarian minister, historian, okay. and abolitionist um, sympathizer too. And Randall says to each of these guys, he says, I got this information, I don't know what to do with it. I'm told that it's these cars. And he gets conflicting guidance. His buddy on the far left, Samuel Joseph May, says, I drag the, the phrase he uses is, I would drag the corpse into court. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I drag the corpse into court, and I'd give all the detail you could possibly give, and I would, I would put the finger on those cars. Okay. Jared Sparks, on the other hand, says that it's best not to revive forgotten slanders. So he gets conflicting guidance about what to do. But it doesn't make any difference because the Jefferson family insists decidedly, that was the phrase that Randall used, the family insists decidedly that you can't, you can't talk about this, you can't use this information. They, and he says they put an absolute veto, and this was the only case he claims, that the Jefferson family made an absolute veto that said you can't do it. We, we, we just, on this subject, we don't want you to, to but you can share it privately which is a bit intriguing. You can't publish it, but if you got trusted people, yeah, you can go ahead and share it privately. So he goes and shares it, of course, with these people and others. There, there's a significant correspondence that he has with other people where he'll brag, hey, do you want to know the story about that? <laughs> and, and, and then they write back and say, yeah, we'd like to hear that. And then he tells them the story. Okay. So. He publishes the book in 1858, and it's a sensation. It, it's a, it's well received, well reviewed. Um, Merrill Peterson, one of the foremost Jefferson historians of the 20th century, called it the publishing event of 1858. The biography, it, 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 is, it is a, for its time, a, a very good book. We wouldn't, we wouldn't read it today as our first source to learn about Jefferson, but it has a lot of information that you can't find other places. Okay, so. In a letter back to Sparks after he's published the biography, he says, I hardly acquiesced in Colonel Randolph's views. In other words, he says at this time, yeah, I agree that the best choice was, and it probably wasn't time because he would have told a lie. If he'd, have, if he'd have used that information, it would have gone down in history as gross misrepresentation and a lie. And the way he treats it in the biography, there's no mention of Sally Hemings throughout the biography. She's indirectly mentioned a couple times. Um, he dismisses calendars, calendars as pseudo history, and it's just it's just not an event in the biography at all. And he writes the letter that I quoted you from Randall to James Parton. He writes a letter to Jared Sparks in 1859, which covers the same ground. So we had he wrote multiple letters given very extended accounts of this conversation that he had with um, Thomas Jefferson Randolph. So up until now, the defense has been physical, and it's been Peter Carr. Now, that's real damning. Okay? Now, that, now, there's no way Jefferson could have done this. And who would have thought that you could have had a lie that big, right? Well, we're going to find out they did and now we're going to get a couple other pieces of information um, 
on, on the next slide, John. But it's a private affair so far. The family is talking to the family. It's private. They're not publishing anything about it. They're not acknowledging it. They're not damning it. It's for private consumption. In 1862, the guy on the far left, that's Edmund Bacon, he was one of the last overseers at Monticello from 1806 to 1822, and he writes a memoir in 1862. And in that memoir, one, he says, yeah, my daughter, my, my wife has been told by the Hemings people about this situation when Martha would, Jefferson was dying or standing around in the, in the death room. Sally Hemings was there and there was, and there was this deathbed promise made of, about raising the children. And he goes on to complete um, his, his story about that and he says, yeah, it was the cars. He said, matter of fact, many a morning I have seen him come out of her room, coming up the mountain to Monticello early in the morning from his, from his uh, overseer's cabin. I have seen him come out of her room many a morning. He says that. He's, he's in Kentucky at this time. This is 1862. He's out in Kentucky, and to, to our knowledge, there's no collaboration between the Jefferson family and him. He says, I saw her, I saw him coming out of her room. Okay. Well, <laughs> that, that's staggering. So, so he says that in 1862. And then the defense goes from, so now that's public. Okay, we had a private up here. Now that's not a bestseller, by the way. So some people see it, but that's not on the front page of the New York Times. James Parton, who was our first professional biographer, lives 1822 to 1891. And in the early 1870s, he's going to publish a biography of Jefferson, a one-volume biography of Jefferson. And he appeals to Randall for information, particularly as it would relate to this Heming scheme. Because we hear in 1873 that Madison Hemings is going to publish an account, and it's going to come out in the newspaper, it's going to come out in the Ohio newspaper where he's living just outside Cincinnati at the time. And that account is going to say the real truth. So Randall helps pardon. He writes in that letter that I just read to you, a little bit ago, saying it was, the, it was those cars. <laughs> and Parton publishes his book by serial first, and then he publishes it in book form in 1874. And in that book, he does not mention the cars. He says a near relation. But he does publicly make the statement that it wasn't Jefferson, those children were born by a father that was a near relation of Jefferson's. So, so these two men here make it more of a public statement. Okay. And I'm going to go back now uh, and describe what happens in 18, and read to you what happens in 1873, and then we're going to have a 100-year law. 100-year law. Now, all of the people and all of the accounts that I've talked about so far are white. They're not a black man, black woman, in the bunch. It's all white sources, all Jefferson sources, all Randolph sources. Okay. So now I've gone, John. I don't. I'll, never mind. I don't have. I don't have one to to go. So in 1873, we have Madison Hemings is going to write an article. I think he has help. We we believe he was literate, but uh, we think he had help, and he publishes it in the. Pike County Republican in March 1873, and I'll just read you some of the highlights. Now contrast this with what we've been talking about. It was the cars, couldn't have done it, physically not there, the biology doesn't work, okay? So in here, he says, coming back from, from France, he says, soon after their arrival here, here in Virginia, she gave birth to a child of whom Thomas Jefferson was the father. It lived but a short time. She gave birth to four others. We knew, we know that. And Jefferson was the father of all of them. Their names were Beverly, Harriet, Madison, myself, and Eston. Three sons, one daughter. 
we all became free agreeably, not free in the sense that he's free, but um, comfortable talking about it. We all became free agreeably to the treaty entered into by our parents before we were born. Now that's pretty different than what you're hearing from the Jefferson. So, but it's a black source, right? And he's saying, w without any equivocation, um, that the father of Sally Hemings' children was Jefferson, Jefferson. right? Now, prior to that, he says, accounting for their time back in um, France, he says, during that time, my mother became Jefferson's concubine. So he's saying the relationship began in France. She's about 16, um, maybe at that time. And when he was called back, she was pregnant by him. Now, we don't have any historical evidence that there ever existed. What the person was this person was called President Tom in the press. We don't have any concrete evidence that says such a such a child was born, existed, died, anything. We think it just, it's probably it could be a mistake, but there's no record of such a person ever being born. However, many of the other aspects of this four or five page memoir written by Madison Hemings were true, can be verified. It's accurate, consistent with historical facts that we know today. Well, a couple months later, he had a friend, another slave, up on the mountain, and his name was Israel. And Israel Jefferson, in on Christmas Day, 1873, he takes to the um, press too. And he says that since my residence in Ohio, I have several times visited Monticello. My last visit was in 1866. And there he, he goes into a very, um, I'll say pathetic, description of Thomas Jefferson Randolph living in poverty amongst the ruins of his plantations because the war is just decimated. He did not flee. He didn't really support the Confederacy. And because he was in the South, the um, Union troops treated him pretty roughly. So he lost um, quite a bit. He claims he lost upwards of $80,000 um, during the war. But very significantly, Israel, who's living in Ohio, did know Madison at Monticello. He says that I also know that his servant, Sally Hemings, was employed as his chambermaid and that Mr. Jefferson was on the most intimate terms with her, that in fact she was his concubine. This I know from my intimacy with both parties. And he's saying, I know directly from first-hand uh, observation. And that, in fact, she was his concubine. That I know from my intimacy with both parties. And when Madison Hemings declares that he is a natural son of Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence. Get that irony. The author of the Declaration of Independence. And that his brothers, Beverly and Esten, and his sister, Harriet, are of the same parentage. So he's not saying, hey, I was the only one. He's saying, they're all Jeffersons. Okay? So that, that's an extended relationship. That's not um, one time in the shack. I mean, that's a long-term relationship if you're going to claim all of the children. I can as conscientiously confirm his statement as any other fact, which I believe from circumstances, but do not positively know. Kind of undermines his own statement there at the end. But he goes on record there is saying, well, you know, my friend is telling the truth. I can confirm that it's true. Again, it's a black source. Thomas Jefferson Randolph, the, the grandson, takes violent exception to the, um, to the statements. And he writes a rebuttal to this White County uh, Republican. It's never published. Don't know if he never really sent it. We do have the letter, though. We don't know if, if they just didn't publish it, he never sent it. But he takes in, and he does raise some good points about the credibility of Israel where things could not have been as they described them in, in some of the specifics of the scenes. But you do have another source that's directly corroborating. Um, now, Randall, our man, the main character in our show here, Randall, keep that in mind. Randall did not have access to these. Randall dies in 1876. He no doubt saw these. However, I have not seen any comment from him on these. And certainly when he wrote the biography in the 1850s, 
those were not available to him. Okay? Though he did have access to black sources. One of his best sources that he uses in the book is Wormley Hughes, who's Jefferson's gardener, was the he's the last survivor, I guess. And he personally took Randall around and showed him the gardens in Monticello as it was falling down in the 1850s. He told him about how I dug Jefferson's grave and et cetera, et cetera. So our guy, Randall, did have access to black sources, but we have no field notes from Randall, uh, no, no, no interview notes from Randall, or um, working drafts of his book. So we really don't know what he knew when he was making his choices about what to include or what not to include. Okay, so important, important development, 1873, but they're black sources, right? Well, for a hundred years, not much happens. Even though now we have public statements, the, the view of what happened remains Jefferson didn't do it, okay? And it's not really, it's not incorporated in, in subsequent biography. It's not um, challenged by the black sources. Um, in 1951, in a biography of James Parton, Milton Flower publishes for the first time Randall's letter to James Parton where he describes this awful con contrivance that um, that the grandson perpetrated on the rest of us, where he tells him about, hey, it was the cars, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the first time that gets published in a modern source. That's 1951. Okay? And then we read that as saying, well, it just confirms what we already know. Right? So for 100 years, not an event. They don't really care about the controversy. Is it a controversy? Not a controversy. Not much happens. Um, historians kind of write it write something into their biographies, but, it, but, it, but it's not a significant event. There's no new discoveries, no challenges, not an issue, and then we start to get some movement. And, okay, John. Again, I, I, I've got two examples out, 1960, 1974. And this is, this is disgraceful, I would say, given for the historical profession. On the far left, which is one of my five favorite books, uh, ever written in American history. The Jefferson Image in the American Mind. Merrill D. Peterson um, wrote a Bancroft, that's the highest award we give in the historical profession for work of history, called, a book called Jefferson Image in American History. And it traces how we have thought about Jefferson from the time he died up until 1960 and how we've made cultural, political, historical use of his image and who he is. So Peterson becomes with Dumas Malone, perhaps the two most significant Jefferson scholars of the 20th century. You put Julian Parks Boyd in that group too, but, but those are the two most prominent, most accomplished, most thorough, most widely read people that deal with Thomas Jefferson. And it, it, it kind of curdles you a little bit here to hear what Peterson said. Peterson writes in, in his book, in 1960, an extended account of Madison Hemings' memoirs. It's the first extended treatment that we have by a respectable modern-day historian. And he calls it first a legend, and then he assigns the motive for such, he called it Negro productions. Was a, we'll say that's a fair term in 1960. But he says, it was a pathetic wish for a little pride. He attributes the motive to Madison Hemings's memoir as it's a pathetic wish for a black man trying to get a little pride by saying, hey, I have an association with the great man Jefferson. That's, that, that, that's, his, that's his reading of it. That's how he attributes it. Okay? He does not question the, uh, the story that says it was the cars. He does not question the physical defense. We still hold that up. And then, even more crushing, Dumas Malone, in 1970, he wrote a six volume bar. He starts at the 1920s when he was a young man at the University of Virginia. He finishes it in, in 1978 or 80 or 81. And in this volume four, or volume, yeah, volume four, 
he treats the miscegenation legend in an appendix. Because it's getting, because of the civil rights movement, now you've got some black um, scholars that mostly in peripheral publications. Okay? There's one, a guy named Winthrop D. Jordan, wrote a, a very famous book called White Over Black in 1968. And that book looks at white attitudes towards blacks. And he's got a very, I'll say a brilliant chapter on Jefferson in that book. And he doesn't say, yeah, Jefferson did it. He's the only um, mature, highly respected voice in the profession that says, it's a possibility. He, it, it's possible that, that he may have done that. Okay? That he may have been Father's Joe. But Malone writes this appendix. And in the appendix, he says, couldn't have happened. He cites Randall's letter to Parton. He cites um, Bacon's, you know, the, the, the account by the overseer that says, yeah, I saw him coming out of the cabin. And I'll get to it in a minute, but he cites a letter from Ellen Wales Coolidge to Joseph Coolidge. In 1974, we'll talk about it on the next slide, we have a, a very direct challenge to the legend in, in Fawn Brody's biography of Thomas Jefferson Intimate History, published in 1974. The Jefferson family, never before, they release a letter, which they published in the New York Times, they published in the American Antiquarian Society's Journal, and Malone is the author that puts it out in, in those periodicals. And it's a letter from Ellen Wales Coolidge to her husband, Joseph, in 1858. And in that letter, she says to Joseph, now Joseph is Boston. He lives in Boston, has those attitudes that you might expect to come from the north, as opposed to the south, and Ellen's living in Boston. And she's down in Virginia visiting her brother, Thomas Jefferson Randolph. And she writes this account. She says, well, we do, we're, we're coming back from church, and the talk went to the yellow children, referred to them as the yellow children. Um, and then she repeats the story to her husband. I find this incredible. She repeats the story to her husband. Now, why do you need to lie to your wife? You know? Or to your husband. But she tells the story to Joseph Coolers that says, you know, it was those damn cars. <laughs> and why she had to finger the cars in a personal letter to her husband which had no intent to publish the letter, had no intent to use the letter, had no, it didn't really, uh, it didn't really have a public purpose to it. So why do you, I, I, I've never really understood that. Okay. But the Jefferson family publishes that in 1970, only in 1974, after the legend, their legend is challenged. Okay. So, so Malone attributes the Madison Hemings memoir to a paternity claim of vanity. Okay, so Merrill Peterson says it's a pathetic wish for a little pride, it's a legend. Dumas Malone, highly respected, Southerner, okay, from Mississippi. Southerner, he says the paternity claim is vanity. Okay? They don't take it seriously. Okay, John, next one. So the first challenge comes in the form of Fawn Brody. Fawn Brody was an academic. She's a defrock Mormon. She um, left the, the Mormon church, and she becomes an academic. Her husband was Bernard Brody, the you know, nuclear theorist and political scientist in the 1950s. And she wrote a, a very contentious book on Joseph Smith, you know, which her, her, her flock did not appreciate. Mm -hmm. And she wrote a book on Thaddeus Stevens. Now, Thaddeus Stevens, as you recall, did have a black wife, right? Or a black mistress that he lived with his entire life. Well, she writes this biography of Jefferson. And it's called Thomas Jefferson, a, An Intimate History. And that's exactly what it is. It's a bestseller. It sells 80,000 copies in hard copy, 250,000 copies in paperback, before she dies in 1980, 81, I guess it was. And she raises the question, or she puts front and center throughout the biography, hey, Jefferson did it. She, took, she takes Madison, 
Hemings and the other memoirs, and she takes them seriously. She says, they're true. Okay? So what does the world look like if you say the black sources are true and the white sources aren't? You get a much different perspective. She uses, it, it, is, it creates, I don't know, did anybody read it when it first came out? Maybe Ed did in, in the 1970s. And it, it was a real publishing sensation. And the historical profession, to its, I'll say to its, I remember being in graduate school in a seminar on early American history. And Norm Rizjord, who is one of our, he's retired now, but he was one of our more prominent historians of the early American period. I remember him referring to her in the seminar class as that clown from UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> and the historical profession, the Jefferson establishment, reacts very vigorously. Um, they, they, they discredit her, they, and she made it easy to do. She did a lot of psychoanalytical theorizing in the book. She made a, bent, a whole bunch of connections that you really can't make very well. Um, she, she uses sexual theory um, throughout the book. It's a very well written book. But she, she goes pretty far astray from what a responsible historian might do with the material. However, we do not know that she was right, um, but probably not the way she thought she was right. But, but it was a sensation, and it caused an uproar in academic circles and in, in the popular world. And I can remember reading it at the time, and I'll confess that I was probably on the side that said she's probably wrong. I wouldn't take that position today, but but I questioned uh, uh, her her veracity at the time, and the historical community comes together, and this is when the Jefferson family releases that letter from Ellen Wales, um, Coolidge that says, "Hey, it was those it was those damn cars? And who knows what else they got in their vaults?" But uh, I, I've been told the Jefferson family does have other papers that they have not released. In, in, a, in a private vault in New York City, but uh, don't know that. She's pretty dismissive of Henry Randall. She said he's not, he wasn't very careful in his research, which was unfair because he misspelled the word Hemings. Well, the Hemings misspelled Hemings. <laughs> sometimes you see it with two M's, sometimes with one, and you'll even see it spelled with an N sometimes. So, but that, that wasn't really fair, but we do know that, that Henry was wrong too, in, in, in what his thinking was. It goes away again. She dies. The profession, you'll, you'll see some, some skirmishes now and then. And then, John? The next major event is 1997. In 1997, another academic, Annette Gordon-Reed, she was a legal scholar, and she had always had an interest in Jefferson. She's black, as you can see. She had an interest in Jefferson, and her approach was, I'm going to take a look at how historians have interpreted the sources. I think there might be bias. So she doesn't know anything. I say, I say that. She did. She, she was an, she's an intelligent researcher. But she didn't know anything new. She didn't discover anything new. There were no new discoveries, no new evidence. Uh, there, there's nothing new in her, in her book. However, <coughs> She does look at how we reasoned about the problem, how we evaluated the evidence, and her conclusion was that, yeah, it, it looks like there was bias amongst historians. And there's no doubt, we do know now, there was a lot of bias um, by the historian, but there was bias in the historians. Well, that raised some questions. She wasn't dismissed like Fawn Brody was. Now, this is 1997, not 1974. Our world has come a long ways in terms of um, self-understanding. And she's at a library giving a speech, a talk, uh, on her book. Now, keep in mind, again, she doesn't know anything new. She's just giving you a different perspective. And she... As, as if you read the full literature, you'll see multiple times historians will say, like Malone did it, Peterson did it, say, well, we'll never really know. How can we ever really know? And she's closing her talk out, 
and Gordon Reed says, but of course, we'll never really know. And a lady stands up and raises her hand. I don't remember her name, but she identifies herself. And she says, well, matter of fact, we will know. We have been conducting a DNA analysis, next one, John, of Jefferson's descendants and Sally Hemings' descendants. And this man, Dr. Eugene Foster, was a pathologist um, at the University of Virginia. He took up with some historians and others to do a DNA analysis of Jefferson. So this is, a, this is the scientist as the historian. Now Jefferson, to do the DNA analysis, she needed a male descendant. Jefferson had no male descendants. Well, the Hemings is perhaps, but he didn't have any that we could identify as a control point. So they used a representative from his uncle, Field Jefferson, his father's brother, who did have a male descendant that was still living. So they got the Y chromosome from him. They had a whole bunch to choose from, from the Hemingses. <laughs> and they ran the DNA analysis, and lo and behold, he publishes his findings in a scientific journal called Nature, the leading scientific journal um, in our country today. And it's only a two-page article, and it was some scientific backup to it. And it's called Jefferson Fathered Slave Last Child. So in 1998, November, November 5th, he publishes an article that says, based on the DNA evidence that we have, Thomas Jefferson did indeed father Sally Hammonds' last child. That doesn't mean he followed all the others. Probably did. But scientifically, the DNA analysis showed that he had indeed fathered her last child. Well, how are we going to react to that? The community, the, the, the evidence did a couple different things. One, it concluded, most importantly, that Jefferson did indeed have a relationship of some sort with Sally Hemings. The second thing that it did is there were black sources, particularly from the Woodson family, that had claimed, wait, we have paternity too. And, and they had created a, a, an entire I'll say industry almost, of claiming direct descendants from Thomas Jefferson. Well, the evidence said, sorry, Charlie, you're not related. So it discredited the Woodson contention. So it shows us that oral history is not always right either. Okay, so we found out some things that surprised us and then other things that surprised us too. So how do we react, John, to to the situation. Well, what you see here, can people see it? Um, it's, a, it's a varied reaction. Okay, this, this is a picture taken on the west steps of Monticello. That's the backyard that looks out on the ellipse. That's kind of open. And no pun intended, but we have mixed results. <laughs> <laughs> the Jefferson family, some of them say, couldn't have happened. Mm -mm. No, we, we can't accept it. And the Hemings family um, descendants, some say, told you so. And <laughs> Oprah has a huge show where they invade. Uh, did anybody see that show? Yeah. I remember seeing it. And on Oprah, they have Jefferson family people on one side, Hemings family and people on the other side. And they're talking about, well, what do you think about this? And you know, of course, some of the Jeffersons say, you know, <laughs> couldn't be. The Hemings family say, we don't want any part of it. Some people say we knew it all along. You get a really big range of res emotional responses. But what you don't have is people questioning the basic validity of the stage of the research at this point, that they do accept it. Okay. Again, the Woodsons are most disappointed because they're, they're out. <laughs> <laughs> One of the Jefferson descendants named Truscott invites Hemings family people to the reunion. <laughs> Literally. To, I mean the Jefferson reunion that takes place every year at Monticello. Now keep in mind, the only thing that the, that the Jefferson family owns today at Monticello is the cemetery. So that, that did not go 
become a part of the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation in 1923, and that is still owned by the Jefferson family, not, and it's not operated by the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. It belongs to the Jefferson family. And in order to be buried there, you have to be able to show conclusively that you have <laughs> that you have lineage that goes to Jefferson. Okay? And at that time, they were saying, "You guys aren't getting in." <laughs> okay? How that what that is what that situation is today? I'm not sure, but you have big meeting in Monticello. You have the meeting in Oprah. You have a lot of publicity. And it's mixed. Some take that uh, immediate reaction that's very negative. Some are more embracing, like the Truscotts were. Uh, and some of the Hemingses, you know, are indifferent, and some are just delighted. Um, so that's how the two families react. Now, the historians, different than before, they rapidly organize a conference at Monticello <laughs> on March 5th and 6th. Now, this is. A new now, um, Merrill Peterson's still alive, but Dooms Malone's long dead. The historical profession, to their credit, this time take it seriously and they believe it and they look at the legend, they look at the mess, they look at how the it, and, they, and they publish their findings too, which are very interesting essays. Uh, much different, much different um, reaction very engaging uh, and sincere belief that this is that this is true now the Thomas Jefferson Foundation that operates Monticello they had been on the side that says it's those cars <laughs> all, all these years okay? and they put together a panel of experts to evaluate the DNA evidence and they come back relatively quickly, and the president of the Monticello Association, Daniel Jordan, publishes a report that says, we believe that it's probably true, that uh, we accept it. And they, now I had visited Monticello several times, not too long after that, and first couple times, they didn't say no. They say, well, yeah, we don't know what we're gonna do yet. After, after not too long a period of time, they change their programs. They change their programs to say, yeah, he did it. Not, not when asked, but they would say, yes, um, the relationship existed. They change their handouts. They up the ante on the reconstruction of Mulberry Row. They up the ante on the search for slave cemeteries on the premises. They started an oral history program of slaves that had lived at Monticello, which it's on their website. If, it, if, if anybody has not visited the Monticello website, it's really a jewel. It's really well done um, in the different programs that they have on that. So that's how they responded. But what I would caution us to, to consider still is that there's, there's a lot of talk, a lot of speculation, you know, Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings, um, when, when people wanted to make, uh, I forgot to mention it, in the 19, 1979 there was a novel written by Barbara Chase Rivaud, um called Sally Hemings. Anybody read it? Okay. Well, in 1979 she writes this novel. And, of course, it's a novel. But she's saying, yeah, yeah, he did. And she's, a, she's a black um, novelist. And it probably helped get it to so But it sold, I think, one and a half million copies. It was very popular. And I don't, know if, I don't remember if it was CBS or NBC, but they wanted to make a movie out of it, wanted to make a miniseries. And they were, and they were well down the road making a movie on that. And two members of the historical profession, Merrill Peterson and <laughs> Louis Malone. Now, now, this is unheard of. They personally wrote letters to the president of the network. They didn't, it was, wasn't the same letter. They each wrote different letters. And they argue that by proceeding and making that miniseries, that it would be a disservice to Jefferson and our country's history to represent that on the screen to all of the American people and tell that awful lie, which couldn't have been true. <laughs> and they capitulated. They pulled it back in the 1970s. However, 
1979, <laughs> a little bit later, we get a movie, Sally Hemings, that does make the net, that does make the networks, and, and you can and you can watch that today. Now we've had several renditions of that, but the profession entirely different. Now, what I'm what I'm leading to here is even though today we can, with a high level of confidence, admit a relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Hallie, Sally Hemming, we have no idea what that relationship was. How do you characterize it? How would you describe it? Now, you don't know whether it was a loving relationship, an emotional relationship, an exploitive relationship, an abusive relationship, um, a continuous relationship, um, one of mutual respect in some way. We, we have no indication, none, of any sort, oral history or written history you know, particularly, that says what was how, how we would contextualize that relationship. You know, we, we said if we only knew if he really did it. Well, we know now that he really did it, but now we're still left with so what? You know, we really don't understand uh, what that meant. We, we certainly understand what that perhaps means to, uh, to, to a life as a black person, to a, um, I don't say intermarriage, that's not right, but to how that functioned on plantations at the time. But in terms of a personal relationship, we, we don't have much to go on. So that leads us to, to Henry Randall. And one more slide. I think I've done the slides at this point. But for me, working on, on Randall, um, his biography of Jefferson is one of the more significant events in his life. Okay? And to to look at that, you know, you know, what are the possibilities? You know, does that mean? You know, the family clearly used him. Okay. And I, I'm still just amazed at how detailed and contrived that story was that they fed to him. And the first question in my mind was, well, did he participate because he believed him? Did he participate because he was co-opted and just he had these other, these other pieces of evidence that corroborated it? Um, or did they co-opt him and he knew it was wrong? And yet he persisted to publicize it privately and never spoke out against it. Certainly he prized his relationship with the Jefferson family. And he looked upon his association as a special, special one with the Jefferson, with the Randolph, with the Randolphs. Um, my own personal belief at this time, and I haven't found anything that's going to help me um, otherwise, is that he was probably duped. He was taken in. He didn't see through it. He had the ability to say, well, you know, I have these sources in Charlottesville that are saying he did it. And I got these other sources that say he didn't do it. Thomas Jefferson Randolph, the, um, the, 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 the um, daughter Ella Wales, uh, the granddaughter, uh, Nathaniel Cabell, you have uh, Douglinson, George Tucker, another biographer of the New Jefferson Well in Charlottesville, saying, nah, he, could, he couldn't have done it and didn't do it. So for him to say, I'm going to dismiss that and put, great, put greater weight on some innuendo gossip rumor. Now, also keep in mind, I think, the 1850s, highly politicized age. Highly politicized age. And Randall was, a, was pretty much a, about politics. Though the biography is a, has a lot of personal information in it, Randall's personal life, politics is an important dimension to his life. And he's seen that situation through uh, a highly politicized viewpoint about what you do to discredit people, what you do as argument, so to speak. And I'm not saying it was right, 
uh, I'm going to, I'm going to I, I hypothesize that that helped contribute to his interpretation about what was a valued source, about what was a less valued source. Keep in mind, he did not have Madison Hemings, he did not have um, Israel's, um, a, uh, you know, and, and who knows what, Wor what Wormley Hughes or some of the other black um, sources may have said as he walked around Monticello. Most of those would have been dead, gone, sold, traded. Um, that, that you wouldn't have had, some of them would have been still in the free black community there in Charlottesville where Sally had gone to live and die with her two sons. But for me, you know, it's, it's been so, it's been interesting to see just how two diametrically opposed um, interpretations of the same event can be so strongly felt and held by legitimate, knowledgeable, so-called objective historians. And at the same time, we could be absolutely so wrong in that. And at one point in time, we say, yeah, we're wrong and we admit it, and we're going to move on to a different world. And another time, we say, we're wrong, we don't know, it, won't admit it. We're not going to let time pass and time change. Um, so, so for me, as a, again, with the interest in Randolph, it, it's a situation that I'll have to address in there is that relationship with the family. And I've spent significant time in the Jefferson family papers, in the grandchildren's papers, um, at, um, at the University of Virginia and other places. And I've talked to other people with more knowledge than myself um, in those papers. And we're, you know, collectively, we have not found anything that says, let's put this tale together, let's put this story together. Let's, um, and certainly nothing from Randall to them or them back to Randall in the correspondence um, suggests that he was, you know, willingly um, working a lot that he knew to be a lot. Um, in that. So, so that's where I am today. Is I, I'll have to write that up in the, in the chapter because that's certainly one of the one of the um, interest points probably for people reading. So, open up to questions. Um, I am not sure what the hardback book is. Is it Gordon Reed's second book? She wrote two. Yes. She wrote one called the second one is the Hemings family. Yeah, she um, after she had written the book on the Jefferson um, Hemings conspiracy or controversy, she wrote a she went to work and did a very thick book that won the Pulitzer Prize on the Hemings family, which, which a marvelous piece of, of history. Right? I think it could be half the size that it is and be a better book, but it, it's a it's a great piece of local history. I'll say locally, micro history about the Hemings family and their life at Monticello and how they came. A lot of genealogical work about how they came to Monticello and that family. I highly recommend that book, but it is big. It, it, it is it's very good large. Yes. yes, very good. Read. Yes, very, very much so. Two things. One statement I'd like to make is uh, inequality and racial problems never change. They're still. <laughs> Okay. The other one is, you, you made a statement that uh, researching at the University of Virginia into Jefferson's papers, library, history, whatever, if the Jefferson family and the people who were Jefferson's friends, uh, diplomats, whatever, why would we think we would find a negativism in the paperwork that was left behind as a trail? Sometimes, well, not I, unlike the Underground Railroad, right. they didn't write things down for a reason. Well, I'm not. I, I haven't just looked at their papers. It's other people's papers too. But sometimes we leave trails we don't intend to. Right. We, we may make a reference. We may make a um, comment. We may make a response that has a much different meaning when you look at it from a different perspective. That may have been have gone unnoticed. But why make the family not look good? by leaving a trail. You're saying inadvertently they could have somehow. Right. And are there, early on when you were speaking, are there still papers that have not been studied or yes. researched yes. that are 
personal properties of the family yeah. that are tucked away someplace. Yeah. The question was, do we have sources today that belong to the Jefferson family that are under protective order, let's say, that are not available to scholars and researchers? And the answer is yes. We don't know. We don't have an inventory of them. We don't have, you know, but, but the answer is yes, we do know that there are sources that we have not been privy to see. But the DNA is there. The, yeah, the DNA is irrefutable. <laughs> it is irrefutable. In the beginning of your story, I believe it was um, the daughter there, Randolph, who said he couldn't have been there. Yes, Martha. What was her basis for saying he wasn't there? Was who was he? She referring to or? Well, her. Well, she was wrong too, obviously. But she well, was she was re yeah. she was referring to he could not have been there because the farm book and the memorandum books, when you cross reference them, show that he was at Philadelphia or he was oh, at okay. someplace else. In 1998, a fellow named Fraser Neiman, who was the archae chief archaeologist at Monticello, did a did an analysis of Jefferson. In 1997, we published Jefferson's memorandum of fee books, part of the Jefferson Papers out of Princeton. We published those in two beautiful volumes. Okay, so any one of us can go now and look at Jefferson's memorandum of fee books, where he paid out money, how much he paid, what he was buying. So we do know that that's a lot of information that places him in time and space. Neiman took those books, and he took the farm book, which was first published in published in fact, simply in 1953 or 51. So he has he had both of those. And he did a statistical analysis and went through those. And he came to the conclusion that there's a 99.99 out probability that Jefferson was indeed physically present 100% before the birth of each of those children. So, but her premise was, if you take the farm book and you take the memorandum book, like Neiman did, she got a different conclusion. <laughs> um, but then again, the Jefferson family would have been the only people to have had the farm book and the memorandum book. Those were not available to them. Randall had, but they weren't available to the public. What made the cars willing to bite the bullet? That's a really good question. Um, I asked that question just before I came down here. I was corresponding with the lady of the Jefferson Papers. And I was asking her if, if they had found anything in the Carr family papers that in the, well one, Peter Carr dies in 1815. Mm -hmm. Ideal candidate, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that meant some of the tests. And then the other one dies in 1855. Samuel Carr dies in 1855. So he was around. Uh, but this was privately told to Randall how much he knew, I don't know. So the Carrs subsequent to uh, that point in time one was a bachelor, and the other one did have a family. The answer, I, I need, I really don't know that answer. But what's really strange when you read the um, the accounts is, on every side when they when they make the claim, they say it was absolutely notorious. Everybody knew. It. You know, the, the the grandkids say everybody knew it was the cars. <laughs> you know, yeah. and and then. The you know the, the slave accounts say everybody knew it was Jefferson. It was common knowledge. The the rumors um, that that circulated around Charlottesville said, yeah, we know it was Jefferson. And what made Henry Stevens Randall pick Thomas Jefferson as a subject? He was 14, 15 when Jefferson died. Exactly. Was there a reaction here in Cortland County? Uh, his father was a general. Yeah. His family ten, were Jeffersonians. Roswell Randall, William Randall, they were Jeffersonians. Um, the, support of the Republican, the Democratic Republican Party at the time. Yes, there would have been, <clears throat> in our newspapers here in 1826 when Jefferson died, there was a, um, a major um, ceremony for Jefferson's um, death. What encouraged Randall to do the book was that he was looking for a topic to write on in 1850. He was looking for a topic. 
and he looked at several different topics, and the Jefferson came to mind because of his sympathy to Jefferson, his sympathy to the Jeffersonian principles, which were part of the political discussion of 1850, and the subject had not been done, and he gained access to the family. The Jefferson papers, for, the, for those that are interested, the family held the papers, and then they sold a bunch of them to Congress. And Congress, but they held back personal papers, and because Congress didn't want them, they said you can just keep them. But the Jefferson family, up until 1847, had held all of the papers because it was their theory of the case that they would get a better better price from the U.S. government if they sold all of the papers together as opposed to making them available to researchers on a piecemeal basis, or sold them piecemeal. So the Jefferson family sells them in 1847. They, there's, they don't really take control of them until a year or so later. So when Randall comes along in 1850, whereas many, I'll say many, several other biographers or literary people had made applications to the Jefferson family to say, I'd like to write a book on Jefferson, they turned them down. But when Randall applied, they said, come on down. But it, had they not sold those papers in 1847 to the U.S. government, Randall probably would have been stiff-armed too. So circumstances had changed. And then when he could gain access, they gave a, and the family was willing to help, that gave him a very unique angle um, in the biography. That's how he came, that's how he came to do it. I have a question. Uh, you've spoken about uh, Jefferson's relationship with his family. What about Randall's relationship to his family? Were they supportive of him? Was he devoted to them? I mean, what kind of a relationship existed between? We don't. Randall lived his whole life here. He did not like to travel. He had a stint in Albany. He did travel to the Midwest. He did travel to the South. He did travel to New England. Uh, we'll go to Albany, go to Syracuse. but. He did not live extended periods of time away from his family. When, when I read through the surviving correspondence of Randall, there's relatively few, there is some, but there's relatively few letters between family members. But from everything that I could gather, he had a very devoted relationship with his wife and with each of his kids. Uh, how they came into play, if any, in his biography of Jefferson, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't have anything to predicate that. On. Did you say how he was chosen by to write the Jefferson papers over other authors? In other words, what did he have that the other authors? That's a good question. Were applying for. That's a good question. Um, what he had going for him, a winning personality. <laughs> he, it, it's it's a funny, it's, it's a very good, it's a very good question because if you looked at what has this man done in his life up to 1850, in 1848 he wrote a best-selling book on sheep husbandry in the South. Okay. He's going to write another book on sheep husbandry in 1861. He's going to write another one in 1863. He's going to write a whole bunch of agricultural articles. He writes a bunch of political pamphlets for the Jeffersonians. He writes newspaper articles. Um, he writes a lot of stuff in the, in the New York State agricultural proceedings. Uh, but he doesn't write any history. He doesn't write any history. So for, but he was recognized as very, had, with, with, a, with a very quick pen and, a, and a, being a very good writer, but he did not have a, a background in history. Um, well, he had a background in, in the historical knowledge, but not, he didn't have a track record for the writing of the history. Now, the Jefferson family, as they look at that, they probably, I'm, I'm guessing, they say, if I want to establish a good rapport, what better person to give a favorable review to a Southerner Jefferson than to have it come from a northerner than Randall. So I think that was part of it. Another part of that was, I asked Merrill Peterson that question one time. And Peterson's response was, 
which I didn't think was a particularly good one, but he said, I think they just hit it off when he went down to, when he went down to, uh, to Monticello. So, so I, I don't know exactly what was in there. Now, Randall was their ideal choice. He was so full of enthusiasm and full of himself that when they show, show him some love, so to speak, that he's all over that, saying, yeah, yeah, they really like me. They're telling me things they tell nobody else. <laughs> and, they're, you know, they're just reeling them in. And they controlled what he saw, what he didn't see, probably much more so than he ever imagined. Uh, so, but their choice, uh, I think a lot of it was just timing, that he happened to be there, and they happened to have a need, and he happened to have a wish. Now, which, which Randalls did you say, I'm sorry, which um, Jeffersons did Randall deal with? The two principal, two principal points of contact for Randall, well, the first one was Thomas Jefferson Randolph, right. who was Jefferson's oldest grandson, the oldest grandson, and then also George With Randolph, who was the youngest grandson. Yeah. He also dealt with Cornelia. He had extensive dealings with Helen Wales Coolidge. There's a, um, a book that Helen <laughs> Wales Coolidge put together at the University of Virginia about all of her letters that she exchanged with Randall about Jefferson. Mm -hmm. And in the biography itself, Randall incorporates um, things from a number of the grandchildren at great length, um, in, in their entirety, maybe several pages at a time. So, so he dealt with a lot of the grandchildren. Well, I noticed with the two Randolph grandsons, there was a difference in their ages. Mm -hmm. I think it was over 20 years. Mm -hmm. She had. 10 or 12 kids. Right. But I mean, I know from coming from large families that what the end of the line remembers is nothing like at the beginning of the line. That's where more comes in. Is Annette Gordon Reed related to Sally Hubbing? So just have an interest in it. No, not to my No, not to my I've never heard anybody suggest. Yeah. And I talked to her a couple times, but uh, I don't, I don't ever hear, remember hearing that. Excellent source book. The sources are just interesting to me. Where she put together to update that book, the new one is mm -hmm. just so much better. I mean, the second version. The second yeah. version is so much better. She did, yes. Yeah. yeah if you read this book, um, I don't know your name. My name. Your name? Mary. Mary. What Mary just said was, if you if you go in and you look for this in a bookstore, make sure you order to get the second edition of that, not the first edition. She made corrections for it in the second edition. That, that, that you want to get. John? With documents locked away, uh, is there any evidence that there was more than just Sally? Yes. There was? There was more than just Sally. Um, as in that oh. as um, Fawn Brody, may manifest, but, and it's not a question that Jefferson also had a unfortunate, and he did admit this, that he had an unfortunate relationship with um, Betsy Walker. Mm -hmm. Betsy Walker was the neighbor's wife. Isn't <laughs> 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 that pretty good evidence? That he... Yeah. Yeah. So did the Walkers get to come to the reunion? <laughs> <laughs> Walker didn't want to have anything to do with him, and, and she told on him. And um, yeah, that was that wasn't a good show. <laughs> show your back. Yeah, that wasn't a good show. Well, he did keep his promise to his wife. Yeah, you remember? Yeah. How do you know? How do you know? Yep. No How do you know you can't do DNA Sally. on everybody? <laughs> How do you know you didn't marry Sally? Well, I'm going to guess he didn't. Uh, <laughs> I guess. You know, if, if guess. the question for, for him, to, he didn't free her either. Uh, in Virginia, in 1826, if you were to free a slave, let's say I was to free Josie here, okay? <laughs> and you had to move from the state. You couldn't live in Virginia as a free, as a free black, unless you had special 
fee. Compensation, not compensation, but you had to have special permission from the, from the state legislature. They made it difficult. You had to get special um, permission from the Virginia state legislature in order to continue to reside in Virginia once you were free. So it could have been, didn't want to do that. It could have been she was free. I suspect she probably was, but, um, but she would have had to have left town with nowhere to go in her, in her golden years. Were there any other slaves that he was affiliated with that had children? Well, on with the Betsy, estate? There yeah. was Betsy. Um, she was supposed to be the mistress of Samuel Carr. Maybe, maybe, he was, maybe he was the master of them both. Um, don't know. I, I, I don't know of any, maybe somebody else does in here, but I don't know of any um, charge, accusation, reference ever that would have associated Jefferson with multiple slave partners. I, I've never heard that. That doesn't mean they didn't, but and I've in never France? heard that. When he went to France, they didn't have to be slaves, you see. His girlfriend in France, <laughs> see? Uh, see he, we suspect he did have a relationship of a short duration with Maria Cosway right. in France, where he struck up a romance, and he wrote one of his great letters called My Dialogue to My Head and My Heart, uh, in that we believe that he had a short relationship of a brief something in Paris. <laughs> 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 a big thank you to Rick. <laughs>